All right. What is going on, everybody? We are back with another Serious Angler podcast. We are joined again once by Mr. Lou Minetti here. What's up, everybody? Captain We're Andy back. down at the end. What up? And uh, we have one of our favorite guests and one of your guys' favorite guests, Mr. Steve Barden with us here. Hey, everybody. Good to see. Good to be here. Uh, I see that I'm the only one that doesn't have a spotlight on me for some reason. Look at this. Look at this <laughs> video. I'm that, the only that's, one. That's because you're the focal point of this episode. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. We're going to be grilling you for well, 20 minutes are, here. Y'all are washed out. And <laughs> I look... I look excellent, I'm sure. We're you washed do. up. <laughs> yeah. Washed up and washed out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, well, Steve, one, thank you for joining us here. Uh, it's always good one to hang with you, learn from you. Uh, but now it's pretty cool to be able to do a show in person. Absolutely. Finally. Yeah. Uh, we have Louie back here again because we brought it up on our recent show. Have you met Louie? I did We did. Louis we just met. Expo. Oh, perfect. Yep. Perfect. We're going to make sure we're doing the show with that I, introduction. I a soft a... introduction. We ran into him as we're rocking the Independence yeah. Hall. Yeah. Beautiful. Like, Steve, hey, Andy's like, totally like screaming at me like I don't have anything to do. And he's like, Louie has a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just put your head in the spot. Later, I said later, Louie's going to have a question for you later. He's like, let's do it. Now. The best part is I don't know that I have one question, but I think we're we going to have like a great 20? conversation. Yeah. Well, it's just a, a questions, I guess. Well, questions. I mean, hey, we yeah. talked about it a little bit on our show with Louie before that. If you guys haven't checked out, it's the one previous from this one. But Louie. Yeah, the floor is yours, man. Ask away. He's he's our bank of knowledge yeah. here. So so I mean, basically, I've been confused is a good way to say it with okay. uh, the the whole F one project as a whole, just based on everything I've ever been told, and it, it could be based off of bad knowledge, but everything I've always been told was that Norman is simply not nutrient full enough mm-hmm. to be a really successful lake, and it's always been the biggest problem with the lake as a successful fishery um and it seemed to me always that the spotted bass introduction although invasive and not great it's ruined lake james it's ruining a lot of other mountain mm-hmm. lakes in the area it seems to do really well in lake norman okay um so i always kind of saw the issue with well is, is there any effort is, is there any real um success that could come from kind of introducing more largemouth as opposed to just you know, kind of accepting it's a spotted bass fishery now and kind of catering it towards that. Okay. Uh, we're going to unpackage this one. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's a lot. I know there's a lot there. A multifaceted I know. answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to do that. So let's first start with uh, Lake Norman is not managed specifically by one entity. Right. No reservoir in the country is. You have different groups that have different stakeholders, and they, and they need the lake to do different things. The lake was not originally built to be a bass fishery. It was built to provide water and provide energy to the local community. Right. So you have Duke Energy. They are, of course, producing energy, supplying it to the Charlotte area. You also have a water authority that takes the water out of the reservoir and sends it to, to people's houses to drink. Okay. Then you have the North Carolina DNR and North Carolina DNR, their job is the fish. They're, they're going to, they're going to s- sample the fish, make fish recommendations. Those three entities have competing uh, mm. resources and competing needs and stakeholders and all those things. So for the water company, they need clear water. Clear water means the filtration system doesn't have to work as hard. It means that they, they don't have a tax on their system. So if we look at uh, Lake Norman itself right now, as a biologist, we would consider it oligotrophic, which means it is a low fertility. It is Mm. a low fertility lake. So if if I was North Carolina DNR, the first thing I would say is, hey, we need to fertilize. We need to get the lake more productive. Then we can grow our fish to a larger size. Mm -hmm. That competes against the water authority. So the water authority says you can't do that. And they have... Uh, they have precedent in that area of water quality. So we can't change the fertility of the lake. So I'm trying to qualify that as like, okay, if there's a carrying capacity on the lake right now, and it is what it is. It's already a barrier we we can't break. We can't break that one, okay? So then we had the lake existed, uh, you know, since the 60s, and it it grew fish, and it was a largemouth fishery. There was some, some smallmouth that were in the fishery. There are no native spotted bass in the fishery. Right. The spotted bass show up in the early 2000s. Originally, we thought they were spotted bass. It turns out they're Alabama bass. Alabama bass have only technically been a species uh, since 2009, I believe. So through DNA, we figure out Alabama bass is a species. That that doesn't really matter as much. But they are introduced. When Alabama bass hit a fishery, 
they're, they go through this exact same process. Uh, first, they start to push the largemouth to all the creeks and away from open water. And they do that through, through overcompetition. They spawn just slightly earlier, uh, but so they do it with overcompetition. And they also do it with hybridization. So initially, when they were stocked, they hybridized with the largemouth really well. Uh, what this does is it decreases the actual ab abundance of largemouth. So Lake Norman has a carrying capacity. Whenever the Alabama bass or spotted bass were added to the lake, it wasn't an additive effect. It's a replacing effect. Mm -hmm. There's still the same support of number of fish or size of fish or whatever because it's carrying capacity, pounds of fish. So we have a reduction in largemouth bass. What that has done is it actually has increased what we call relative weight or the individual uh, body condition of a largemouth. So the largemouth have actually gotten slightly better. There's just fewer of them, harder to find. Now, Norman, oligotrophic, it grows fish slow anyways. Mm -hmm. So it's growing Alabama bass slow. It's growing largemouth slow. Okay. Add genetics to it now. Now okay. we're going to start talking about F1s. So an F1 is a Florida northern cross. Right. The fish in Norman originally, the largemouth, were northern largemouth bass. That is a completely different genetic than the Florida bass. The F1 is the first generation cross. So F1, first generation cross between a Florida bass and a northern bass. There are things FX, so F2, F3, F4 sure. that happen naturally, right? Uh, so the F1, what, what they're trying to do, what they're experimentally looking at is if I add Florida genetic to the, the largemouth that's here, will it be more aggressive? Will it have a better top-end growth? Which we know, we see this across the country. F1s uh, you know, typically have a larger growth, uh, optimum growth, than, than the northern largemouth. That's slightly due to the fact that they have a slightly longer lifespan as well. So if, if once again, I'm putting in the F1s, it's not an additive effect. The Alabama bass and the northern largemouth will have to, to go down in numbers to accept these new F1s that are stocked. The question becomes, in five years' time, is their growth rate better than the northern largemouth growth rate? And if it is, then can we get a better optimum growth? So you're still going to have Alabama bass, mm -hmm. and they're still going to have that same niche within the majority of the open water reservoir. Right. The largemouth that are in the channels will now be replaced or hybridized with this Florida genetic. And we're hoping through this experiment that what comes out is a fish that grows faster, grows to a larger overall size, and lives a little bit longer. So whenever it hits six, seven pounds, we still have a couple more years of that fish being an adult. Maybe we can see some 10 pound fish. Compared to right. a northern, which right. at six or seven is about done. Right, so at, at this point, uh, well not done, but let's just say six and seven is, is starting to become top end. They can be 10 pounds. Sure. That can happen, but it has to be an exceptional individual. Yeah. Uh, but, but kind of the point becomes, we have this carrying capacity, and what North Carolina DNR is looking at now is what, um, what can we do? We can't change fertility. We've opened up the ability to harvest as many Alabama bass as you want, and anglers aren't doing that. That would be a way to pull fish out of the system and open up pounds in the carrying capacity for the largemouth to continue to grow, and we don't do that as anglers. Mm -hmm. uh, so now they're going to add F1s to try to increase that overall growth on that side. What we could do is promote catch and keep of Alabama bass, fillet Alabama bass. If you go out and you catch 10 on Lake Norman, and they're in that, let's call it, um, you know, 12 to 14 inch class, pound, pound and a quarter, let's eat them. That would be the best thing for a local angler to do. Because you're to taking make, biomass out of the system. Because it's carrying capacity. If I'm raising 100 pounds per acre, and I've got 10 fish, they're all 10 pounds. If I have 100 fish, they're one pound. If I have 1,000 fish, now they're little bitty. Now, fish don't have to grow. We've talked about this before on the show. Fish don't have to grow. They can live their entire life if they're not consuming enough forage to grow to a larger size. So whenever I am, am surveying Lake Norman, if I was on the DNR, they're taking age samples from both the Alabama bass, both the largemouth bass. They're taking those relative weights. And what they're finding out is the growth rate per year. They're also finding out that maybe some of these one pound, seven ounce uh, Alabama bass are actually three and four years old fish. 
well, their lifespan seven to eight years, they aren't going to become four pound fish. Mm -hmm. So now we're stuck with something that's technically stunted that has a high reproductive potential that's pushing the largemouth out. So at, at this point, the support for the F1s would be we've exhausted a lot of other options. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at is an experiment. Mm -hmm. If we add these fish, do we see a difference? The answer may be no. And if it's no, what have we invested? We've, we've invested you know, money, time, but we've replaced the largemouth that were already there. So that's, that's not that big of an added effect. Gotcha. The Alabama bass is, is by far the issue uh, with Lake Norman. You could argue that the other issue would be the triploid grass carp that are in the lake that limit the aquatic vegetation growth, really limit the habitat. You could argue that the age of Lake Norman and the fact that the, a lot of the trees have, have started to decompose and be, be covered in silt would be another additive factor. Uh, so this week at, at Red Crest, one of the things we're doing with Kevin Van Dam Foundation is he's donating $5,000 in Mossback Artificial Habitat. And uh, our, our fisheries management division with the with, uh, partnership with Mossback Fish Habitat, we're going to match that. So we're going to end up with about $10,000 in artificial habitat that can go into Lake Norman. Awesome. Whenever it goes in, it lasts forever. Right. Um, you know, it could still get covered in silt over a long enough timeline. You're talking a all, long time. All, all reservoirs do that. Sure. Um, but it will start replacing some of that, that you know, timber style habitat that, that we just don't have anymore. I mean, if you watch the live stream, you see the water's down about four foot right now. You see a lot of shallow water. You see a lot of dredge marks around docks, things like that. That's silt. Mm -hmm. That's not what the lake was originally. So then, you know, we talk about like the F1 project and, and what are the results going to be. Um, part of that, we need to talk about, number one, we are managing a man-made reservoir that's not a natural environment anyways. And the reservoir is slowly aging and the aging process is the addition of silt. And sometimes those reservoirs age with the addition of silt and they accumulate nutrient. Sometimes it, it prevents nutrient mm -hmm. from, from happening. And that's due to the watershed. Uh, but the reservoir is not the same as it was 20 or 30 years ago. So the management can't be as well. I guess, uh, I mean, I, you definitely cleared up the F1 thing, right? That, the, the replacement of the northern with a better species, in, in essence, makes a lot of sense to me. Right. Um, my one, I, I still, I guess we're at another place where I'm confused is where if the Alabama bass is the problem, um, it seems to me like the last six, seven years, weights in tournaments continuously go up. Mm -hmm. Is that what's, the, I, I guess, is that a better strain of the Alabamas or? No, no. All, all Alabamas are the same strain. What you're seeing is a cyclic effect. Okay. And what, what happens with every reservoir is you have cycles. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a weather, typically a weather dependent thing. So the lake is down five foot right now. Sure. We're going to have different habitat grow in. We're going to have sediment harden. Then the lake's going to come up. Is it going to come up to full pool or is it going to go above full pool? If it goes above full pool, that would be what we call a new lake effect. And okay. When that happens is you have a, a, a real quick spurt of additional bait fish. You have a higher success rate of your juvenile fish survival on your fry largemouth, your fry Alabama bass, things like that. But you see an increase in fish, which increase in food increases growth. Um, you will also have, conversely, low water conditions or really hard winters or things like that, struggle years. And so you'll see these cyclic effects if you get enough of them. Sounds like row. what happened in California. Absolutely. You get enough of them in a row and all of a sudden you see a trend and that trend's going to change over time. If you... Whenever we talk about fisheries management, we try not to look at individual years. If you're looking at an individual year and you're trying to make a decision based on, well, this year we had this much growth or that growth, you'll miss things. Sure. So we look at a 10-year timeline. So if we look at 10 years, what we see is the Alabama bass density peaked and then has started to decline and then level out. Largemouth bass was up here, went down, and has stayed down. Mm -hmm. But we see largemouth relative weights increasing. Interesting. So that, that's a predictable thing that happens when Alabama bass are, are introduced. Um, what you're going to have is now that the Alabama bass have stunted, they're where they're going to be. You'll have exceptional individuals. You're fishing a five fish limit. Mm -hmm. If we were fishing, major league fishing, every fish counts, we would showcase how bad the Alabama bass issue is because we would have anglers 
that are catching one fours, one sixes, one sevens, and they're catching 75 in a day. Sure. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at a five fish limit, a cumulative bag and saying, well, that bag is better than I saw five years ago. Yeah, sure. There's large mouth in that bag. There's some exceptional individuals as a spotted bass or Alabama bass. Now they've leveled out. I mean, we've seen 17 to 20 pound bags of Absolutely. spots. Absolutely. Like, yeah. When the last we've seen three fours. years. We've seen several fours caught this week. Yeah. And a five. Uh, and a five. Yeah. I mean, uh, there was a five caught today. That's Those are exceptional fish in that population. You have to look at the entire population. So at electro fishing or whenever I get done this week, I'll have somewhere around uh, 1,500 fish mm -hmm. uh, that, that will log. Analyze. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and we'll be able to tell a little bit about the actual size of those fish and, and where they lie and what percentage were over that three, four pounds. Yeah. Um, it's hard. You know, you got a hundred anglers out on the water and you're saying, yeah, you know, we had a 17 pound bag. Okay. Well, that's one guy that caught, you know, five, four pound fish or whatever it is. Right. That doesn't count the other, let's call it 90 guys that had 14 pound bags. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, it seems it, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, I'm, I'm interested to see if that, that kind of class of spots, like you said, like those exceptional fish because of a, an exceptional year, whether it be spawn or whatever it is, kind of dies out in 10 years or if that trend continues. Is it uh, something you think that could? or it's So they're going to continue to hybridize with largemouth. Mm -hmm. That's reducing over time because largemouth density is decreasing. But even our guys are commenting, there's a spot and a largemouth on a bed together. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, so that's going to continue to happen. So you'll have some, some genetic mixing that occurs. You have the F1s being introduced, so that's going to cloud the results a little bit. Um, but your, your spots are currently at a, a, what we consider a stunted state. So unless we have an environmental change that changes that population up or down in density, then they're going to maintain. Hmm. If we have something that reduces their population, they're going to increase in size. Right. Less individuals, carrying capacity stays the same, so you'll have larger fish. Sure. So if we could get angler harvest started, uh, you know, maybe like one event a year, we have a fish fry Yeah. at the end of the event. But I don't want your five biggest. Right, right, right. I want you to weigh your five biggest, and then I need in the other live well, I need 10 fish that are a pound and a quarter. It yeah. sounds like you need to have an event with like a cut line, kind of like how they do with redfish fisheries. Yeah. Right? You have a mandated size limit and be like, okay, whoever wins this with 12 to 14 inch fish and we harvest them all at the end, that would be like a pretty yeah. good solution. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you could have like essentially your slot tournaments where yeah, it's like if you have one over a, a certain limit, that's like your fish, you know, the, week, the Texas Fest kind of style. You release those if they're above, if they're below, <laughs> we're cooking them up tonight, boys. Like, right. we're going to eat right. them. Right. I think that'd be a really interesting size. solution. That uh, would be an, an angler proven solution yeah. to make the fishery better. Yeah. That's yeah. It, would cool. help, it would help the, the northern largemouth that are here. It would right. help the F1s that are being introduced. And it would help the, the Alabama bass that are being released because they're they're larger size fish. Yeah. And I think I think that's one of my the, where my problem lies with it's not necessarily the law, it's how some people go about it. You know, I see on Facebook, it's like, oh, you know, kept my 15 spot limit and they've got three four pounders it's like yeah. man <laughs> that's just education <laughs> right we just need to educate right. on on you, you got to look at it one of two ways yeah either i'm trying to improve the fishery so i need to educate on what size fish to pull out and yeah. we need to actively do that or i want to eradicate alabama bass which is going to take a much larger effort and then i want every size class of alabama out right it's unrealistic at this point that you can eradicate alabama bass out of the system because also, you know, they, they've moved beyond. Like, mm -hmm. So that's super cool. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. That, that, that is a really good conversation. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Did that kind of answer the thing you were talking about on last. Yeah. Year? I mean, I think it definitely clears up for me and some others is that, that, you know, this, these, these large fish limits and, and the F1 stocking is more so not necessarily get rid of all of them because, like you said, it's not going to happen. And there are good solid fish in there. It's more so to better the largemouth population with a higher successful a more successful species and to get rid of those stunted smaller spots right that's awesome yeah and if you don't do something um it's it's not going to continue to improve louis and at some point yeah that population of, of alabama bass is going to increase in density and you could end up with a fishery with 
10 to 12 inch fish. Yeah. And then nobody wants to fish Lake Norman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So uh, before we wrap this thing up, I, I wanted to ask you, you, you talked about how you have $10,000 of, of moss back habitat that you can now put into these lakes. Is there any rhyme or reason or strategy behind like where you're going to go put them? Like, do you guys like discuss like location or is it just, Hey, you see that point? We're going to pop there and there and there. No. Um, so we look uh, for several things. Number one, I want to put the habitat somewhere that I can check the results. And it, it's kind of a misnomer. I'm not putting in the habitat so that you as an angler can go catch fish on it. That, that does happen. We publish the GPS points, you go catch fish on it. What I want to do is I want to put the habitat in an area that's known to our scientists they're where they're doing their sampling so that we can say before habitat, after habitat. Mm. How did the population change? Did we see an increase in forage fish? Bluegill sunfish abundance, something like that. Uh, also, do we see non-largemouth or, or Alabama bass species like crappie? Do we see their populations increasing in the area? So we want something that's measurable. Uh, we do use topography. We look at bottom hardness. Uh, we look at, you know, boat lanes, how people travel. Um, there's a lot of technology now where we can actually track cell phone location as a general population and, and look for hot areas where anglers have fished. That's Sometimes so cool. we go to local bass clubs. We talk to them, uh, get them to mark on maps areas. At Major League Fishing, we've got a really cool thing called the score tracker. Every time an angler weighs a fish, their official sits down, they enter it in a score tracker, they press enter, that iPad gives me a GPS location of where that fish was. That's so I take that and say, our anglers caught fish here. Mm. How much do we have to access to the GPS? Darn. But you can get access to all the other information for free. Oh. Uh, MajorLeagueFishing.com. Trying to get them There's waypoints. The nah, waypoints. <laughs> waypoints. Yeah, no, no. Uh, but but we would then create that map and we would have the discussion of, do we want to increase habitat in the areas where anglers are already fishing community holes? Sure. Or do we want to provide new areas that are maybe not exploited or historically would have been good areas with timber and we're going to restore habitat. So we look That's at every cool. fishery That's really different. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, for folks that are either coming to the expo or that are tuning into the show remotely, uh, what are you, what's going on for you this weekend? Where can they come see you if they're here? <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah. So if you're in, in the Charlotte area and you're coming out to the park expo, what I'm personally doing fisheries management division, we'll do a seminar every day from 1130 to 12 okay. on the Optima stage. And then from 12 to four, I'm going to have a group of boy scouts that are going to earn a fish and wildlife management so merit cool. badge. That's awesome. And awesome. So they're going to go through about eight hours of education community service projects they're going to build the moss back habitat they're going to learn about bald eagles they're going to learn about line recycling from the guys at berkeley labs and then we're, we're going to make a service project where they're going to create large six inch uh diameter two foot long recycling tubes and they'll donate oh, those to yeah. north carolina Sweet. and south carolina they'll be at the boat ramps so whenever you're fishing uh one of the things we have everybody's fishing line right the fishing line is one of those things, you know, you bite a tail in, you pitch it over the side. It's happened. Or we pitch it in the bottom of the boat and it flies out. Well, right. that lasts in the water 600 years if it's monofilament. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. that's an impact. <laughs> um, and so, so Berkeley Lab specifically has decided, uh, you know, to make an effort to recycle that line. And so we're building line recycling tubes. The, the local DNR can then take that line if, if anglers participate. They can pull that line out and send it to Berkeley. Berkeley's going to recycle that into things like tackle boxes that then can go right back into English hands. So, so it's a really cool fantastic. process. The Boy Scouts are going to help us build them. We're going to build 100 of them and donate them. Uh, we're going to donate them to the DNR. So they're going to do that service project. They'll get a merit badge. Yeah, it'll be a good time. And then at night, um, or right before the anglers come across the stage, me and Kevin Van Dam will do a, a couple ceremonies. He's going to donate five thousand dollars to the F1 stocking project. Heck yeah, um, yeah, and that'll happen tonight. Uh, awesome. And then Great. tomorrow we'll we'll make that Mossback donation official, and uh, we'll make Fantastic. sure the crowd here gets to see that. So if you're in in the Charlotte area, please come by and see us. We've got yeah. a lot of things going on. Awesome. Yep. Well, appreciate you guys all tuning in. Yeah. Appreciate Louis, Steve, you guys joining yeah, us on the show. Appreciate you having the conversation with Absolutely, me, man. Absolutely, Louis. Uh, yeah. Andy, I'm so glad you didn't say anything, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, if you're in the show again, like Steve mentioned, come see us. If not, we'll see you on the next one.